Alhamdulillah, Rabbil Alameen, wa salatu wa salam ala nabiyyina Muhammadin wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in. Brothers and sisters, assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Welcome to another episode of the methodology of the prophets in da'wah. Coming towards the end of the description of the methodology of the prophet sallallahu alaihi wa sallam in da'wah, or at least a part of it, I thought it was best that we take some time to reflect upon the character of our Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and those qualities that we find within him and indeed within all of the Messengers Alayhim Wasallam in terms of their personality and their nature and those things which made their call to Allah Azza wa Jal more palatable and more acceptable to their people. And in this I want to begin by mentioning a clear point about the methodology of our messenger Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and that is that our messenger Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam did not suffice with good character in his da'wah and what I mean by that is he did not rely upon good character alone and this and Allah azza wa jalla knows best is a mistake that some of the people who call to Allah fall into that they rely simply upon good character. Good character alone is not enough in da'wah. Good character is a complement to your spoken and your written da'wah that you give. As for this concept that the Prophet ﷺ would do silent da'wah, then this is something that is not known from him ﷺ. Rather, he would make this silent da'wah, the da'wah of the character and the personality and the good treatment as a part of his da'wah and not the only part of his da'wah. Now I'm not saying that people are not guided by people's personalities and that people have not been guided to Islam by good character. Many, many people have been guided to Islam by good character. But when that good character comes in addition with calling them to Islam, in addition to writing to them and inviting them to Islam, there has to be an invitation. And that is the meaning of the word da'wah. The word da'wah is an invitation. And so what I don't like is to see people saying, when you ask them, what da'wah have you given to them? Oh, I've been so kind to them. I've brought them food. I smile at them. This is not da'wah. This is a part of the complement to the da'wah of the Prophet Wasallam. The da'wah of the Prophet ﷺ was to call them to Islam, either individually or that they heard him generally speaking in public calling the people to Islam. That that person needs to feel that they have been called to Islam and not that if you were to stop and speak to them, that they would turn around and say, I didn't know that he was inviting me to Islam. Or I never thought about accepting Islam. We have to get away from this. Good treatment is essential in da'wah. Good manners are essential in da'wah. And they are a huge part of the da'wah of the Prophet ﷺ. But to think that the Prophet ﷺ simply stayed silent and gave people gifts and smiled at them on the street, this is not the da'wah of the Prophet ﷺ in anything. The Prophet ﷺ complimented his da'wah with his character and his manners. But those people are people who heard him invite the people to Islam. They are people who heard him tell about Islam. It is impossible to believe that there was a person in Makkah that the Prophet ﷺ gave a gift to or smiled to or treat well that didn't know about Islam and that didn't know that he was there to call people to Islam. 
and that he wanted them to accept Islam. And yet we see this exact circumstance happening today amongst the du'at and the people who call to Allah Azza wa Jal. That the person has no idea they're required to accept Islam. They just know that Muslims are really nice people. Muslims are such lovely people. And yes, that may for some people lead them to go from the stage of Muslims are nice people to let me become Muslim. But for many people it doesn't. They need invitation, they need a push. They need somebody to say to them, become Muslim. I'm inviting you to become Muslim. And this is the methodology of all of the prophets in Dawah. That they would call their people to accept Islam. And they would warn their people of the punishment. And they would give the glad tidings of paradise. And they would write or they would speak publicly and privately. And they would complement that with the best of manners. And this is the methodology of the Prophet ﷺ in Dawah. And this is what we want people to get in the habit of. Good manners that complement your spoken and your written da'wah bi'ithnillahi ta'ala. And so we come to look at some of the characteristics and attributes that are befitting to be found within the caller to Islam. And the first is to say that the greatest of them is just in general the Muslim character. And everything that is said that is good about a Muslim's character is good to have within a person who calls to Islam. And so all the things you strive to have in a Muslim's character, good treatment of parents and kind speech to others and greeting people kindly and smiling to people and so on and so forth, all of these things are good qualities to have in the caller to Allah. So everything that is said about the Muslim personality is an important thing within the caller to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But there are some things that are important to highlight. Not because the others are insignificant, but because these are perhaps the most relevant to the specific job of calling people to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The first is sincerity. That the character of the messengers was one of sincerity. And when we read from Surah Al-A'raf, we saw the prophets alayhim salatu wassalam, Nuh and Hud, and Salih and the other prophets mention sincere advice. Nasihun Amin wa ansahu lakum. The word nasiha, sincere advice, and sincerity towards Allah Azza wa Jal and sincerity towards people in your actions towards them. This is the fundamental part of the character of the caller to Allah that they are in themselves sincere for Allah. They only want what is with Allah. لا نريد منكم جزاء ولا شكورا. We don't want from you any reward or any thanks. As for when da'wah becomes about other than Allah Azza wa Jal, like those people who call to Allah to get famous, or those people who call to Allah to get married, or those people who call to Allah for wealth and for status, then this is when a person is taken away from the path of Allah. And I'm not saying that you can't earn money as a diet. What I mean by wealth is that your intention is that if I had the money, I would do this fi sabilillah. And if I don't have the money and I have to take something in order to be able to live and someone is willing to give that in order for me to be able to live and to continue calling people to Allah, that's acceptable. We have no problem in that. But your intention is that you're doing the action for the sake of Allah. And if there is some worldly benefit in it for you, alhamdulillah, but your intention behind the action is that it's for the sake of Allah. And one of the worst things is when you see a person, if he is paid, he gives dawah, and if he's not paid, he doesn't give dawah. And this is not from the sincerity that we would expect from the caller to Allah Azza wa Jal. Rather, the caller to Allah Azza wa Jal is one who calls to Allah in every circumstance, in every situation. And they are engaged in that call to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And if they do that as a living, alhamdulillah. But it doesn't stop at five o'clock on the dot or three o'clock on the dot. I don't give da'wah now because I'm outside of my work time. Rather, 
it's something that continues and if they get a benefit in it which allows them to live alhamdulillah that's not a problem so a person should question their sincerity and look at their sincerity towards Allah and ask themselves that if I had the wealth with me that I didn't need to earn from this would I still do it that if I was married and I had what I wanted from this world would I still be going out to give da'wah or am I only here in the hope that I find somebody to marry? The first hadith in Sahih al-Bukhari. Indeed, actions are taken into account according to their intentions. And everyone will have the reward of what they intended. So whoever's hijrah is for Allah and His Messenger to practice the religion of Islam, then their hijrah is judged and rewarded as being for Allah and His Messenger. And whoever's hijrah is for something of worldly benefit, some money, some worldly gain to get, or a woman to marry, look at the way the Prophet ﷺ said, فَهِجْرَتُهُ إِلَى مَهَاجَرَ إِلَيْهِ He didn't even mention the word of what he did. He said, whatever insignificant thing that he made hijrah for, that's what he gets. This is what the ulama mentioned regarding the statement of the Prophet ﷺ. It's tawbiq. The Prophet ﷺ is speaking ill of it. The Prophet ﷺ is ridiculing the person who does it, that they would make hijrah for whatever insignificant thing there is that is less than the reward that is with Allah Azza wa Jal. فَهِجْرَتُهُ إِلَى مَهَاجِرَ إِلَيْهِ Whatever he made hijrah for, let him have it. That's what he gets. So whoever's da'wah is for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, then his da'wah is judged, and his da'wah is rewarded, and his da'wah is given the barakah of the da'wah that is for Allah Azza wa Jal. In accordance with Allah's law and the law of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. In accordance with the book of Allah and the sunnah of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And as for the one who their aim is money or their aim is marriage or their aim is fame or their aim is any other thing, then their da'wah is only judged and rewarded as what they did it for. They get some worldly benefit and they lose all of the benefit in the akhirah. And we seek Allah's refuge from that. We'll talk more about these characteristics and attributes inshallah after the break. Until then, assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. The same, the same hear about it, the more you desire to prepare for it. Life after death. Journey of the soul. The day of resurrection. The torment of the hellfire. The reward of paradise. Stay tuned for a life-changing, heart-softening, spiritually uplifting series about the hereafter exclusively on Peace TV. Know the vivid descriptions of paradise and hellfire from the Quran and authentic Ahadith and acquire life-changing habits to be successful in the hereafter. Next on Peace TV. The same, the same star. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. We're talking about the attributes and the characteristics that are specific to a person giving da'wah. 
And from these are knowledge that a person is a person of knowledge and a person who speaks based upon knowledge. And we've already talked about the evidence for this. أَدْعُوا إِلَى اللَّهِ عَلَى بَصِيرَةِ I call to Allah upon certain knowledge. So the person is a person who is sincere to Allah. Sincerely wanting what is good for people. And they are a person that they, when they speak, they speak with knowledge. And we said that doesn't mean that you have to have a huge amount of knowledge, but it means that you speak about what you know. And you know your limits and those things that you can't answer, you either go and find the answer before, before you speak, or a person refers them to the knowledge of Allah Azza wa Jal and says, Inda Rabbi, the knowledge of this is with my Lord. From the characteristics that are specific to the person is that the person be wise. And we said that this has a number of elements to it. We've talked about this in previous episodes. And from this is that a person is wise and controlled and calm in what they speak about. But a person doesn't rush to say things. And we sometimes see this in dawah, that people rush and people feel compelled. When someone says, what do you say about the statement of Allah? This or that or the other. And the person feels compelled that they have to give an instant reply. And so they reply with something and their reply is deficient or their reply is wrong. And then the person again, and they end up falling themselves and causing themselves to slip, causing themselves to fall, causing themselves to lose the opportunity for doubt. So the da'iya is the one who is cautious and patient and thinks about what they say before they say it. And they have wisdom and they have softness. A person who is soft and gentle, a person who is calm and controlled, not a person who gets angry quickly, but a person whose anger is controlled in that which Allah Azza wa Jal loves, as the Prophet ﷺ would be. That when he would get angry, salawatullahi wa salamuhu alayhi, it would be controlled. And it would be in those things that Allah Azza wa Jal loves and is pleased with. And so self-control and a calm nature and being a person who controls their emotions and a person who responds to bad treatment in a way that is better, this is part of al-hilm and al-hikmah that were praised by Allah Azza wa Jal and by the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam having a calm and controlled nature, not rushing, being considerate, thinking about what you're going to say. Don't allow the person who is debating with you to take you and carry you away into anger or into emotion or into blindly saying something which is not appropriate. And from this is the statement of Allah Azza wa Jal, do not speak ill of those who are worshipped besides Allah, in case those people speak ill and curse Allah, adwan bi ghayri ilm, from their ignorance and their lack of knowledge, that you would get to a stage where you would, for example, curse or speak badly about something that is worshipped besides Allah, in a way that offends the person, and then they would say that your Allah is like this, and they would end up cursing Allah, without knowledge, and this is an example of losing a person's self-control. So the Prophet ﷺ and the Sahaba radiallahu anhum were commanded not to do this. So I think one of the major lessons we have to learn is the da'iyah, the one who calls to Allah, is a one of self-control, a person of self-control, a person of modesty, and a person of humility. And having tawadur, being humble and having humility, is from the major qualities of the da'iyah to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And Allah azza wa jal raises those people who lower themselves before Him. That you lower yourself before Allah and Allah azza wa jal raises you up. And this quality of humility and humbleness is not a quality that you show deliberately on your limbs and leave your heart free of it. And it's narrated from Umar radiallahu anh, that he would say to the reciters of the Qur'an, O oh, reciters of the Qur'an, raise your heads, piety is here. And he would point to the heart. This is the nature of the Muslim, 
who is sincere towards Allah Azza wa Jal, that their humility is in the heart and it shows on the limbs. As for those who show a false humility, then what happens is it's a facade. It's something that is on the outside, it's not on the inside. And that will show in their da'wah. So when they go to call a person to Islam, they'll begin very humble, full of humility, and full of calmness, and they're a very soft person. And then the minute that facade is cracked by a harsh word or by a statement of pride or something like that from the person they are calling, they snap. And all of their humility is gone. And we see this among some of the Muslim brothers, amongst the Muslim sects and groups, that you see them the most humble of people and people who are covered in humility from top to bottom. And when you ask them a question about some of the beliefs that they hold, the humility is gone and the humbleness is gone because it was all just painted on the outside. As for the statement of Umar radiallahu an, the humility is in the heart and it shows on the outside. And so that is the humility and the humbleness that stays. And this is what people love to accept. They don't love to accept from someone who is haughty and full of pride. They love to accept from someone who is humble and someone who has humility. And that humility doesn't show by lowering your head and by painting it on the outside, but it comes from the inside. And when it comes from the inside, it shows on the outside. And there's a difference between the one whose humility is right through from their heart to their limbs and the one who paints a fake facade of humility upon themselves and yet their humility is missing from the heart. From the characteristics of the da'iyah is wanting good for the people who are being given da'wah to and being kind and gentle with them. And the Prophet wasallam is described in this way in more than one ayah. From this is the statement of Allah Azza wa Jalla, قَدْ جَاءَكُمْ رَسُولٌ مِّنْ أَنفُسِكُمْ عَزِيزٌ عَلَيْهِمَا عَنِدْتُمْ حَرِيصٌ عَلَيْكُمْ بِالْمُؤْمِنِينَ رَعُوفٌ رَحِيمٌ There has come to you a messenger from you. It's hard on him, those things that trouble you. He's keen for what is good for you. And he is towards the believers kind and merciful. And from this is the statement of Allah Azza wa Jalla, فَبِمَا رَحْمَةٍ مِّنَ اللَّهِ لِنْتَ لَهُمْ By a mercy of Allah, you are gentle with them. And the other ayat that talk about gentleness and talk about kindness and talk about care over the people you're calling. And one of the pious predecessors, rahimahullah ta'ala, he said a beautiful statement. He said words to the effect that your place in Jannah is not given any higher or any better if your brother goes to the hellfire. Your brother going to the hellfire does not increase your place in Jannah or make you a higher status in Jannah. What gets you a higher status in Jannah is to be a reason for that brother to go to Jannah. As for condemning everyone to the hellfire and simply being a reason for your brother to go to the hellfire and not being a cause for their guidance by the permission of Allah Azza wa Jal, then this is something that doesn't give a person any extra status in paradise. The status comes from calling people to Islam and them accepting you and you being a cause for them to enter Jannah. As for you simply condemning people and not caring about them and being happy for your brother to go to the hellfire, this isn't from the characteristics of the caller to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And from the things that we must mention are the importance of acting upon what you know. Allah Azza wa Jal says, كَبُرَ مَقْعَةً عِنْدَ اللَّهِ أَن تَقُولُ مَا لَا تَفْعَلُونَ What an evil, huge sin in the sight of Allah that you say what you don't do. And you see this from the Christian preachers, from the Jewish preachers, and from the preachers of other faiths, that they stand on camera and they stand in public gatherings, exhorting and admonishing the people to fear Allah and to accept religion and to be pious. And then you see them in their own deeds and they are the worst of the people. nas, The biggest fisk and the biggest disobedience of Allah within them. And this is not from the characteristics that we attribute to the person who is calling to Allah Azza wa Jal. And from the major things that we must talk about is patience. And we've alluded to this many times in previous episodes and so I'll just remind you of it here. 
the great need of patience and the great need of enduring the suffering and enduring difficulty from people because people will treat you badly and people will get put difficulty for you and people will not listen to you and you'll see them turning away from you that requires an immense amount of patience and the eventual reward of that patience is nothing less than success in your da'wah and paradise from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and until next time assalamu alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh the same the same star gaze right down at rasulullah they saw him climb down from here now a prophet